This is Invisible Inc., the podcast for under-resourced women entrepreneurs. And I'm your host, Shubha Chakravarti, founder of Achieve. Join me as I talk to women entrepreneurs about the nuts and bolts of their journeys and to experts who will give you insights that are hard to find anywhere else. Let's jump in. How do you bring a radically new idea down to earth and make it real? How do you validate the market for a product that doesn't even exist? And how do you do this with a view to getting a very specific kind of incubation and growth support, as well as capital in a narrow niche industry? In this episode, insurance technology entrepreneur, Sota Rosawo, talks about her incredibly thoughtful and systematic approach to capturing and selecting ideas, how she balances head and heart in navigating her startup path, her step-by-step approach to validating her market with a small budget, getting the exact right accelerator for her niche startup, and much more. Now, here's Sota. Hello, Sota. Welcome to Invisible Inc. Hi, Shiva. Thank you so much for having me on today. So excited to chat with you. We're excited to have you. So let's jump right in. When and how did you decide to become an entrepreneur? You have a pretty interesting journey. Entrepreneurship has been on my mind since I was a kid. Back in high school and college even, I would make and sell commissioned artwork and jewelry. While I was working my first job out of undergrad, I actually had this curated Excel file that detailed all the companies that I was going to start along with their product lines, their estimated revenue generating capacity, and how it was going to lead me to retire before age 50. (laughs) That is incredible. (laughs) So, you know, when it came to launching Sentinel, I had the overwhelming sense that the time to move was now and that waiting any longer would only be essentially wasted time. In fact, in the months leading up to leaving Allstate to focus on Sentinel full time, I had a number of tech companies and finance companies reaching out to me to see if I wanted to join their teams. But I felt that taking another corporate role would just leave me, you know, three to five years down the road, right back in the same spot, wishing that I had taken that entrepreneurial leap. And so I said, you know what? No, no more waiting. Like we have to strike out now. We have to try it now. That's what I'm here to do. And I'm excited to be able to live into that. And just out of curiosity, was there a theme around these, all these ideas that you put in a spreadsheet? Were there things that kind of popped out and said, that's a screaming theme throughout? I mean, that's one thing that's... I think maybe like there were three kind of spheres. So the ideas were very much around design. So that was one channel. And ultimately, I would still like to do something around design. The second sphere was around virtual assets. I was like really into, this is like 2010, like the coin of white paper had recently come out like a few years before that. And the first real world Bitcoin transaction had happened. I was working at an ad agency with State Farm. My agency had a competition to dream up new business models for your client. So I was like virtual asset insurance. Because at the time, people were spending thousands of dollars on in-game assets in like World of Warcraft and then thousands of dollars to spend them or even more to get them back if they lost them. And I was kind of like, this is the future. So like that was like another channel. And then the third channel was around social good. So to me, like a question had always been like, how do we build self-sustaining engines of economic growth. We can't just rely on what can sometimes be like band-aid solutions. Like how do we create solutions that then create the solution and propagate the solution? Those are the three things that I was focusing on. And even today, back in 2020, I was looking at three options. And interestingly enough, they kind of aligned pretty well with those three themes. I guess I'm consistent. Um, the reason why I chose Sentinel was that I saw an upfront pressing need, but also my thinking was, it's a big idea, not a necessarily bootstrappable idea, but should it work, I can provide a lot of value to people in the short term and in the near term. And then also an idea that's big enough to then be able to fund going into some of the other two areas. So that's a fantastic segue. You set me up for the next question. Tell us all about Sentinel. What does the company do and what's your vision for the company? So Sentinel provides claims-free coverage for hard-to-insure risks. And we do that by taking what's called a parametric approach. So your standard insurer is very much focused on the level of damage that their policyholders experience. The policyholder experiences some damage, they file a claim, and the insurer figures out how much of that loss they're going to cover. Sentinel, on the other hand, does not focus on the level of damage. 
Rather, we focus on the parameters that define whether or not a risk has occurred. So let's say you have a guy named Bob and he says, I want coverage for my flight. I want a $500 payout if my flight is either canceled or three hours delayed. We would say, it's okay, Bob, we have got you. We are monitoring your flight details in real time. And should we see that your flight is either canceled or three hours delayed, we're just going to automatically send that payment to you. No need to file a claim or anything like that. So what Sentinel does is it takes the underlying principle in that example and applies it to hard to ensure risks in four areas. Those four areas are interrupted utilities, so like power outages, power surges. The second is around infectious diseases. So for example, testing positive for COVID and being hospitalized. The third area is around climate change risks like hurricanes, flooding, um, that sort of a thing. And then the fourth area is around canceled events. So once again, I know going into the pandemic, I had a number of friends and acquaintances who had to cancel their wedding plans and weren't necessarily able to get reimbursement from some of the vendors that they worked with once cities and towns went into lockdown and all of that. So each one of those four areas is massive. We don't plan to try and tackle them all at once. Our initial use case is going to be around interrupted utilities. We plan to launch with coverage for power outages, power surges, that sort of a thing. And then from there, grow out into being able to provide coverage for the other risk areas. Wow. Okay. That is pretty complex. I can maybe see some of these themes coming up from your earlier ideas, but where did this idea come from? Like, How did you put it all together into this cohesive, comprehensive concept that has become Sentinel? So my first brush with insurance was doing brand strategy work for State Farm. And that's where the whole virtual asset insurance idea or concept first kind of popped into my head. And then fast forward the clock, post booth, me and I went to Bain, where I did some work and diligence around digitalization and insurance to bring data-driven, digitalized approach to insurance. So I left Bain and went to Allstate, where I managed product strategy and innovation. One of the first things I noticed when I got to Allstate is that the common risks that we face that are the bread and butter of a typical PNC insurer are actually becoming, many of them at least, are becoming inherently less risky over time. So if you look at the balance sheet of a state firm or an all state, one of the cash cows is going to be auto insurance. But I was thinking to myself, what happens when we reach full autonomy, right? You know, if your self-driving car that you can't take control over gets into an accident, are you liable or is the OEM manufacturer liable? And I think the answer is that the OEM manufacturer's liable. Personal lines are going to become commercial lines. I think we're already seeing this with a significant amount of OEM auto manufacturers vertically integrating up the chain into insurance as well. On the other side of the equation, I noticed that many of the common risks that we face every day are incredibly difficult to cover using standard insurance means and mechanisms. So I thought to myself, given the proliferation of data and access to data as well as the advent of decentralized and distributed systems. Why can't we use or leverage that data to make these hard to ensure risks coverable? So that's kind of sort of what set me down path to thinking about Sentinel and wanting to see if this could be a path to providing value. So I'm thinking you have all these ideas. You mentioned having three finalists right before you picked Sentinel. Did you use some criteria? Did you score them? Like how did you, was it just gut instinct? What was that process? Some element of it was intuition. The next level was thinking through how quickly can I deliver the most amount of value so that I can unlock the ability to do other things that will then also provide value. I would also say thinking about in terms of value, what is the mission that each one of these businesses would be trying to accomplish? My goal and Sentinel's driving mission is really around um, providing peace of mind when insurance just isn't enough. The aim was to not necessarily replace insurance, but to complement it. And so we focus on those risks that insurers typically exclude from their coverage plans. And we also try to uh, alleviate the pain that insurance poses due to the claims process. And so it's like, think about everything that's happened in the wake of Hurricane Ian. You have Many people who went for power without days and likely will not be able to claim on the damages they suffered from that. 
moreover, not just policyholders, but carriers also are expressing a lot of dismay over whether they're even going to be able to process the sheer volume of claims that have come through. And even if a policyholder was to get their claim processed, they'll face the prospect of really high deductibles and they'll need to start repairs before they may even see a reimbursement. And so with Sentinel, on the other hand, those policyholders could get a check right away to start getting their lives back on track. That's the mission for Sentinel and the way in which Sentinel is going to deliver value. And that's immediate. Which hit and check that box on why to prioritize this now, as opposed to some of those other ideas that I had. It sounds like you focused on value and you defined value through the lens of impacting the people that you eventually want to impact in a very visible tangible and immediate way Mm -hmm. so you have the idea clearly it's something you can't start on the street corner and bootstrap your way into what happens next how did you figure out how you're going to take the next steps how did you create that roadmap I like to be as data driven as possible. And so one of the first things I wanted to do is like, I felt I need to get the answer to two crucial questions. One, does anybody actually want coverage for these hard to insure risks? (laughs) And two, is it even economically viable? And to get the answer to those two critical questions, I commissioned a study with 400 participants. I was actually almost a little bit afraid to like actually deploy the study on the pull the trigger on the study. And I was talking to my sister about it. And she said, well, what are you waiting for? And I'm like, well, what if the data comes back and it says that people really need this or like it's positive? And then she's, well, yes, <laughs> then you do it. And I'm like, I'm like, well, yeah, but then I have to do it. Um, <laughs> uh, then she's like, you need to get out of your own way. So I did. I got out of my own way, deployed the study and the results came back showing on the demand side of the equation, three things. One, people were concerned. Over 70% of U.S. adults indicated that they didn't have adequate coverage for the risk areas that Sentinel was targeting. It also showed that they want coverage. Over 70% said that they would be interested in purchasing coverage. And they were also shared the levels of coverage that they would like according to the payout amount. And so with that information, I was then able to start plugging in data on risk probabilities and saw that, yes, there is an economically viable path forward for Sentinel. Okay. You said you deployed a survey. How did you find the 400 people? How did you make sure that they would be valid if you went to an investor because you were going to have to go to investor so that they would stand the test of scrutiny? And then how did you design the question so that you knew that they would be valid versus just you dreaming up some random questions? Yeah, I think it was a blessing that I started off my career on the marketing side of things because it gave me a very consumer, human-centric perspective. And I also think back to when I was an undergrad and I was thinking about what could be interesting to me. I thought about consulting a little bit, but as I was going through the case studies, I realized that the marketing studies were the ones that I thought were the most interesting. So there's maybe a little bit of a natural bent to focusing on the consumer, focusing on the human. That experience within marketing, I think also helped me to understand what like tools were out there that I could leverage. So I I knew that I needed to be scrappy and don't have the biggest budget, but I also knew that I needed to create a study that was going to be statistically significant and have broad reach and try to eliminate any potential confounds in the data. Fortunately, there is a tool called AYTM or Ask Your Target Market, which is really great for quickly deploying studies where you're able to choose a level that gets you to a statistically significant threshold, which is why I chose 400 participants, as well as giving you the ability to reach nationwide. On the back end, you can get all of this demographic data as well to see who was answering these questions, what industry were they in, where do they live, all of that kind of stuff. So you can do a lot of further analysis on the back end as well. In terms of structuring the study, I wanted to make sure that I was not leading the witness. So it's almost like you think of a funnel. And I started from a place where the funnel was widest, allowing the consumer to first tell me what they think without me leading them with a question. My first question was, tell me, and it was free response, tell me all of the risks that you face that you don't feel like you have adequate coverage for So when I got that information back, I was able to then start categorizing to see what themes emerged and see if there were themes outside of the, uh, it was actually five risk areas that I had identified. 
And so from there, I then asked a question saying, okay, here are five risk areas. Do you feel like you have adequate coverage for these five risk areas? Uh, from there, it became, okay, do you wish to purchase coverage for these five areas? Okay, all right. If you were to purchase coverage on a scale of zero to $10,000 in increments, how much coverage would you want to receive? And then on a scale from zero to say hundred dollars, like how much are you willing to pay for considering the amount of coverage that you want? So kind of like building out the study in that way where it just kind of got narrower and narrower and narrower and all the way through continuing to provide the participant with the opportunity to write in answers in case there was something that I had not directly asked for that could be on their mind. And did you talk to a marketing expert or someone who's analytically I know you are yourself, but for those of us who are not, did you talk to somebody to vet the survey questions? No, and I didn't necessarily feel like I needed to because I think I would have been the person that would have gotten called having done brand strategy for not just State Farm, for Motorola as well and other clients, and then also managing teams that would then have done this study also at Allstate and other places. I felt confident in my ability to create that study. If you don't have that competence and if you don't have that experience, I would say first look at your network. The last thing I would say is that many of these tools and resources have internalized consulting aspects to their business where you can talk with them to get assistance on developing or structuring a study. To build on that, what kind of budget are we talking about? Like if I wanted to go and do this AYTM, like how much should I put aside for the most bare bones but valid? I like to operate on a dime. So ask your target market. We're looking at maybe one to $2,000 for the level of study that I did, which isn't necessarily cheap, but it's also way below the eye blistering level of costs for other studies that I've done in the past. Another vendor who I've worked with before who I like would be Dscout. My study was more quantitatively driven, but for the more qualitative studies, I think Dscout is great, but they're pricey. So there you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars. There are other studies that I've done with different vendors as well, where you're looking at 90K, 100K, and that's just really out of reach for a startup. So I think that for a very early stage startup, something like Ask Your Target Market is a really great place to start if you're trying to actually get out there and get real live feedback from a broad range of consumers. And are you aware, would you recommend anything even cheaper than that for those of us who are operating on even more shoestring budget? I would say then you got to get down and dirty. There was a volunteer market study project that I did for a decentralized DLT, a decentralized digital technology project. They were trying to understand how to structure their marketing approach. And so I commissioned this study that was both qualitative and quantitative. So on the qualitative side, I just went out there and went on Twitter and just started looking for people. I went on focus groups and said, hey, this is who I am. This is a project that I am collaborating with. Do you have time to chat? So basically did a lot of qualitative interviews that way that I then used to understand the themes around which I should structure a more quantitative study. And so then once I had those themes, I built out a quantitative study. And then I literally, I went to Reddit. You want to find out the places where the people whose feedback you need hang out. And so then going to like those different, often social media channels, and then asking the moderators like, hey, this is the research I'm trying to do. Would you be willing to allow me to share this with your audience? And then being able to get feedback that way. And so through that route, I was actually able to get responses from 600 participants. So that's definitely a way to go. Um, I think the one thing to watch out with something like that is you have less ability to eliminate certain kinds of confounds in the data because you may not get as broadly distributed of a sample as you may like, and you're not really going to be able to collect um, or have access to that demographic data on the back end for further analysis. You can ask some of those questions within your study, but it just may not be as comprehensive in scope. Not to mention the time, the opportunity cost of time it takes, right? Oh, yeah. (laughs) There's that too. (laughs) So were you working through all this or did you just fund it out of your savings? So for Sentinel? 
Well, for that volunteer project, yes, I was working through all of that and it was just kind of out of the goodness of my heart. And because it's also interesting to me, like a problem is most interesting before you solve it. And I never met a problem that I didn't want to solve or like, or an answer, a question that I didn't like if it's unanswered. So that was that. For Sentinel, yes, the first year or so was mostly primarily funded out of pocket. And with Sentinel, like the first thing I focused on doing after leaving Allstate was file a provisional patent and then try to move forward, which has since been converted into a non-provisional patent, and then try and move forward with developing out a prototype as well as expanding the team. To file for that provisional patent as well as to start building and to build up that POC, that was all beg, borrow, and spend your own. No, not even borrow, it's just beg and spend your own money. And so that's, that's what I did. Yeah. When you say POC, you mean proof of concept, right? Yes, proof of concept, like a prototype, yes. Excellent. So what time frame are we talking about? Like you get the idea, you decide on this and all of this. How long are we talk- talking yeah, about Yeah, so the idea for Sentinel first popped into my head in like fall of 2019. I joined Allstate in 2018. The idea for Sentinel really first began to crystallize in my head in fall of 2019. But I call it like a like my book of plot bunnies. Like whenever I have like these ideas of, oh, this could be an interesting route to providing value and then I just note it and then move on. So then it wasn't until mid 2020, we're all working from home thinking like, is this what I want to be doing with the rest of my life? That the idea around taking a parametric approach for risk coverage resurfaced. And that's when I commissioned that study and had those results come back. And so when they came back, I said, okay, this is definitely something I think I need to do. It is not a bootstrappable business. How am I going to do this? And so I started thinking about accelerator programs and then to 2021. And then I decided to leave Allstate in the fall of 2021 to focus on Sentinel full time. And then I said, okay, so the first thing I've got to do, look for somebody with strong background in data and then somebody who also has a strong background in engineering. Before I do that, though, let's see if there's any IP here that's protectable. So I got an contact with a couple of lawyers and worked with them to file that provisional patents, which I funded myself, and then went through an adventure, to put it diplomatically, um, trying to build out the team. People often tell you that the hardest challenge you're going to face as an entrepreneur is finding the right people. That cannot be overstated. It is a fact. And so many twists and turns, I ultimately ended up working with a guy who was a former colleague and coworker at Allstate on the engineering side to build out that prototype. And one of uh, an advisor, Generax CIO Tim Dixon, was super instrumental in connecting me with the wonderful UX team at Invisia, who really championed the vision of Sentinel and helped to build out the initial design. And that's what got things going. Two key lessons that I learned along the way in that first year, just trying to get things off the ground, is that you cannot be too judicious when it comes to building out your team. And to Look for people who put the vision and the mission first. If a prospective team member most primarily concerned with how much equity they're going to get, what's their ownership stake rather than the product and the mission, it's a massive red flag. The second thing I would say, and I think it's been often said before, is to hire slowly and fire quickly. (laughs) And so I think those are some key learnings that I learned from that. And when you talk about the extent you're comfortable talking about it, when you talked about you found this engineer, you found XYZ, advisor is different, but when you found these people to work on your team, what kind of arrangement did you enter into with them? With this particular engineer, we'd known each other for a number of years and his willingness to work on the project really came out of knowing me, thinking of me as a friend and like our friendship. And his thinking of the problem that we were trying to tackle was really interesting and wanting to explore that. And the interesting thing is, and this became like a theme, I was the one who had to bring up compensation with him. And his response on that was, hey, cool. (laughs) Um, But really, right now, I'm more interested in helping you. And for now, like, just donate to Ukraine, (laughs) like on my behalf was one of his particular requests. And I was kind of like, 
cool, doing that already, I can do more on that. But definitely being upfront with offering equity compensation, those sorts of things and being willing to do that and see what the person is looking to do. The data scientist who's also joined the team since she also like, it was shocking um, to me with her because the majority of the experiences that I'd had before were people who like right off the bat, they're like, give me 50% of your company. And I'm like, I don't know you. I've never worked with you. I don't know anybody who has ever worked with you. I don't know what kind of value you can bring. And I don't know what it's worth. And yet you want me to sign this over, right? And so with this data scientist, she was a mentor I went through the accelerator program that Sentinel is currently in. And she said, hey, want to follow up with you, really passionate about what you're doing, love the vision. I want to join the team. I want to work on this. And so we had this extensive conversation. I'm like, okay, cool. So like, what are you thinking about in terms of compensation? She said, no. She was like, I just want to show you what I can do first. And I was like... That's a first. Okay. And for me, I guess it's like once bitten, twice shy with the first data scientist that I tried to bring on. He was on the project um, for almost about four months. And I would say within that time period, he showed me no work. And all of our conversations revolved around the fact that he wanted 50% equity. And he vanished and ghosted like at the last minute, I was hoping to plant and apply to a particular accelerator. And he had said that he was do the data and even some of the early engineering to build up the prototype and that just disappeared underneath my feet at the last minute. But fortunately, I had not signed anything with him around you're going to get like this equity or this ownership or anything like that. So I didn't get myself into a bad situation, but could have, right? Many months later and a little bit wiser, I did some more research around this. And I think some things that an entrepreneur should think about when they're building out their team is lean into trial and probationary periods. So that's something that I'm making standard now for anybody who wants to join the team. And then don't really discuss or promise any kind of specific level of compensation, whether that's equity or cash compensation until after that trial period, because you're really not going to know what to offer because you don't know what value this person can bring um, would be like the second thing. And then of course, the standard, even with that, vesting schedules and cliffs, use them always is what I would say. This is excellent advice and a great suggestion. So for that trial or probationary period, how do you make sure that they're not left hanging for having done the work Yes, and exactly. And so like, the interesting thing was, I loved the fact that this particular person was so passionate about the idea. I was deeply uncomfortable with the notion that like, to me, like, one of the worst case scenarios where we get to the end of this probationary period, and they've done some work that's good, but maybe something about the relationship isn't the right fit. And then they somehow leave empty handed. I'm just not comfortable with that. And so I talked to some different advisors about it. Some advisors were like, they want to do it for free, do it. Like, I mean, what, what's your problem? <laughs> uh, but I was kind of like, no, I just don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. One person said like, well, you know, if you want, you can make them an offer for a bonus payment for having delivered at the end of the probationary period for having delivered the requested or defined task. I did that. So in the agreement for the probationary period, I put that in there that it's not still a startup. So it's not going to be like some huge amount, but it was at least for a startup, a non-trivial amount saying, should you successfully meet the required or requested tasks during this probationary period, you'll be eligible for a bonus of this amount. And so when I went back to the data scientist who's joined the team on that, she appreciated that. And she still held to her, like, I'm here to show you what I can do. But I do appreciate like this gesture as well. And it also helped me to feel like more comfortable with the arrangement. Because like I said, I just don't want anyone to feel as though they're being exploited in any way or that they're being taken advantage of in any way. Fantastic. Thank you. So you mentioned data engineer, you mentioned data scientist engineer. I know you're in the insurance space, but it's a very different take on insurance. I mean, having been in insurance, I know how it works and parametric insurance is different. How would you characterize the industry you're playing in and what's unique that matters to you as the startup founder about this industry? Yeah. So for us, especially when I talk to people who have some experience with insurance is they get caught up on like the underwriting actuarial aspect of this and they're kind of like, well, so like you want an actuary and I'm like yeah actuary would be nice but it is truly and to a degree you could say the actuary's role is like a type of data science but we want to think more 
broadly than just an actuarial approach. And part of that is because with insurance and actuarial underwriting, you're once again very much focused on damage and loss, history and records, we claim history and all that. But because Sentinel's taking this parametric approach, we're focused more on the other side of the equation, which is around the risk probabilities, right? What is the likelihood of this risk occurring to this particular policyholder? So that's one differentiator. I think another thing that differentiates it is when we say what is the likelihood of the risk, what are all of the different sort of parameters that would inform that? And because of the risk types that we're looking at, we're likely looking at much different or seeking out much different data sets than what you would typically see a PNC insurer looking to assess. My guess, and I don't know if this is right, my guess is those would be more publicly available as well than the typical proprietary loss data that you see in clue reports and things like that. Um, Some of it, yes. So some of it is more publicly available. So we recently closed the deal on getting private data sets that will be helpful to us. So some of that, but some of the other information, like for example, if we're looking at weather related risks, that's good. There's going to be a lot more that's publicly available. And so the differential value that we'll be providing is how do we model that data? What insights do we derive from that data? Awesome. Going back to the next big piece, right? So you know, you're not bootstrappable. You have to get funding. How did you approach the whole funding strategy approach? You mentioned accelerators. Walk us through the process of how you thought through that and how you. Yeah. So, you know, like as I mentioned, like the first year of the business was almost entirely self funded. And as we all know, capital, especially early stage capital, is really difficult (laughs) um, to attain for people of color, especially POC female founders. Uh, As a backstop, we are often told to just do a friends and family round. But for many of us, that's just not a viable option, as was my case. However, I knew that Sentinel is not something that I could just bootstrap as a business idea. I mean, I knew I could probably get to the prototype myself, but anything beyond that. I was going to need formalized funding. So I I was looking at trying to get into funded accelerator programs as a primary goal. Unfortunately, Sentinel applied to and was accepted into Northwestern Mutual's Accelerator for Black Founders that's powered by Generator. That was an amazing opportunity, not just because it came with 100,000 in funding, but also because the accelerator focuses on fintech and surtech and data analytics. Plus, it provides a wealth of networking and mentorship opportunities that we've really been able to lean into. So that was the approach. Going into that accelerator, I had three goals for Sentinel, one of which was to take the existing prototype that we had and expand that out into an MVP. And we are well on our way to meeting that goal. And we'll aim to open up our first real round of fundraising early Q1 2023. So there's a lot of accelerators out there. And of late, I've been reading some research, hearing some thoughts expressed in terms of are some of these predatory, you know, not all accelerators are made equal. So clearly, it sounds like you did your due diligence. What did you learn about the whole accelerator space? And what are some of the pointers you would offer to another founder who may be not as familiar as you are in picking the right accelerator and watching out for some of these signs? At least four things are coming to mind right now. The first thing is, um, I just don't believe in accelerators that take your money. If they are asking you to pay to participate, pay to play, walk away because you are the product. (laughs) You are the business model, right? They're not actually, in my opinion, accelerating you, then they're probably slowing you down because this is a startup. You don't have the money to be spending on that. I would walk away from that. That's different from like, a more incubatory style accelerator where they may not be funding you, but they're not taking money from you. If it's more like a incubatory accelerator where they're not necessarily funding you, but they're giving you access to other resources, that's okay. But in my opinion, if they're asking you for money to participate, pay to play, I wouldn't do it. So that's number one. The second would be around the financing. Like, Does the accelerator fund you? Ideally, the accelerator should fund you. And as a sub bullet point here, what are their terms? So I would say for an early stage startup, if you're going to take accelerator based funding, it should come in the form of a note, either a safe note or maybe a convertible note is what I would say. The second and third 
bullet points are very similar, which is funding is great, but funding alone is not enough. So if you're going to look at an accelerator program, you want to see what value do they provide to you above just the check? Are they providing you with networking opportunities and are they providing you with mentorship opportunities? And then the last thing that I would mention is thinking through not just the additional type of value that they're providing you with, but what are their areas of expertise? Is there some kind of like key affinity or alignment between the industry or sphere type of problem that you're trying to solve and their own experience with other startups or with investors or key suppliers or partners within that ecosystem? That's a fantastic checklist. So thank you for that. So in your case, it feels fairly specific against insurance. It's, it's pretty narrow, right? It's fintech, it's insurance. There may be two or three types of accelerators which pop up as obvious suspects. But in something that's more generic, you know, consumer products, stuff like that, how do you go about doing this due diligence? Like, where do you find the information that you just talked about? Do you talk to other founders who have been through that? Like, what are effective methods of doing that due diligence? I would say Google is your best friend. And... There are a lot of compiled lists of different accelerators. Being a nerd, I had compiled a list of all the different accelerators that I had come across and I had like my own evaluation framework for them that kind of very much closely limited the criteria that I just said. And I would rate them based on those things. And I think I had them like divided into like platinum level, gold level, silver level, bronze level. Like that's kind of sort of how I approached it. So like I said, Google is your best friend. Lots of curated lists. Go through those curated lists and then use that as like your launching point to start. And the criteria that I shared, that's my criteria, but everybody's coming from like their own unique perspective or situation. So create your criteria, what's important to you, and then start going to the websites of these accelerators, um, start looking at the startups that are within their portfolio. If you can talk to any entrepreneurs who may have applied to those programs, been interviewed by those programs, got in or were rejected to those programs to just get a sense of what the experience was like and use that to kind of formulate and formalize your perspective on like, who would you actually want to work with? Who do you think is worth applying to? Fantastic. And one last question on accelerators, and then we'll move on to the other fun process questions here. So especially after COVID, earlier you used to have Y Combinator where you actually had to give up everything, go stay there for whatever number of months. Now there's a proliferation of virtual accelerators. Do you have a point of view in terms of is one better than the other or anything in terms of uh, pros and cons? So the accelerator that I'm in right now is hybrid. So there are a few things where we have to be present on site in Milwaukee, but the majority of it we do remotely. And I think it works perfectly for me. I don't feel as though I'm missing out on any kind of experience. We kicked it off with an in-person kickoff where I had the opportunity to meet the founders from the other four startups that were are in my cohort. We were able to like share experiences, develop community, develop that rapport, which was great. We were together for a few days and I felt like that was enough to like get things going. And so we do have every week, at least twice a week, like the whole cohort gets together either in AMAs or lunch and learn sessions or working sessions. And so I feel like that's the right level. And then the rest of the time, there's some one-on-one stuff that each startup does with the accelerator program staff themselves or individual mentors. And once again, I feel like it's just the right amount. One thing that I've heard oftentimes from people who participate in the accelerators that are always on site is they felt as though they didn't have time to actually work on the business, which kind of sounds counterintuitive, but like they were so fully scheduled all the time that they had less bandwidth to apply to like marching towards their goals. And I don't get that sense. So to me, I think hybrid has been a really good experience. Moving on to fundraising, right? I know you're being in the accelerator is going to help a lot with that. Can you talk about how you're thinking about fundraising, how being in an accelerator impacts that? And what your strategy is just in general? I knew that while self-funding might be enough and it was enough to get to a POC, to a prototype, um, that it wasn't going to be enough to get to an MVP and beyond. And to get to that MVP and beyond, uh, that's why I was really considering financing from funded accelerator programs. I also thought about angels and VCs, but really the lead focus was around accelerator programs. The reason why my primary target was funded accelerator programs was because I knew that 
Sentinel would need more than just dollars. It was also really going to need that networking and mentorship. And that's really one of the things, or at least two of the things that you should be getting from an accelerator program. Beyond that, my hypothesis was that I would have a better time, a more profitable time, I guess you could say, trying to find an accelerator program that would be more open-minded around diverse founders. And that has been my experience (laughs) and led to Sentinel partnering with Northwestern Mutual and Generator and their accelerator program. And then as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Sentinel has three defined goals for our time in this accelerator program, with one of them being taking that existing prototype and expanding it out into the MVP. We're marching towards that with the data scientist who's just joined and as we bring on engineering as well. And our goal is to then open up our first official round of funding from angels and VCs, most likely angels, in early Q1 2023. To do that, we're in the process of sort of shortlisting who do we think would be good fits for investing in Sentinel. To assess fit, you really want to look at the firm's portfolio. So are they investing in startups within your industry? You also want to look at the stage. One of the things that I found is that investors, many of them define early stage differently. So you want to understand like what stage do they say they focus on and what is their definition for that stage? Because seed to some is one thing, pre-seed to others is another thing. So you just kind of want to know. And then you want to know things like what is their average deal size for a startup like yours? What are their terms typically? As well as do they lead rounds or do they prefer to co-invest? And if they co-invest typically, who do they typically like to co-invest with? Those sorts of things. Excellent. That's a fantastic checklist. So it sounds like you're well on your way to getting funding, changing gears again slightly. I want to move more to the personal side of you in terms of your fitness and how you felt about the whole process. What were the skills that you needed? What were the ones you felt you had? And what were the biggest ones that you felt you had to pick up on this journey? Yeah, I would say, I think that as an entrepreneur, you have to be scrappy. And I think that just given my background, scrappiness is something that I felt like I do well. You know, so I was born in the UK, lived in Nigeria for a year. I don't remember back to the UK, moved all around the US, lived in Japan for a little bit too. So I definitely say I bring something that I call like, or has been described to me as immigrant mentality, by which I mean, you ask for little and you try to be as scrappy as possible. One of the things that I've had to learn though, is that sometimes not asking for enough or trying to do too much with too little is a recipe for disaster. I'm trying to get more comfortable being more forthcoming around asking for resources, whether that's advice, funding, or introductions. Somewhat related to that is the topic of negotiations. So I think thinking back to when I was at Booth for the MBA, I took a negotiations class and I was like, convinced that I wasn't going to do well in it. I thought it was going to be terrible, but that ended up being absolutely not the case. I actually ended up performing like the best in this class. And what I realized is that the moment I see myself as negotiating on behalf of someone else other than myself, I become like an entirely different human being. And so walking out of that class, and it's been like almost a decade since, I've been trying to reinforce the fact that I shouldn't by default diminish the value of my own personal objectives because I've had to do some soul searching. It's like, why is it that if you feel like you have to advocate for someone else, you can become like a lion. But like when it's advocating for yourself, you're like being sheepish. And we could talk at length (laughs) about all of that, especially as a POC female and what like feeds into that. I thought to myself, number one, (laughs) your aims and objectives matter too. Don't back down by default. And then two, more specific to Sentinel, I remind myself that when I go to the negotiating table, I'm negotiating on behalf of all of Sentinel stakeholders, whether that's policyholders to employees and beyond. And so I think having that, wearing that hat and having that perspective helps. So yeah, so I would definitely say like those are a couple of things. One is um, learning to ask for resources Um, and two, being comfortable leaning into like the negotiating experience. And is there any handy tip in terms of how to learn to ask for resources that maybe we can take? I would say, once again, like I'm a total nerd. Like I'm the kind of person who would create a decision tree to decide if they want strawberry or like caramel ice cream. Um, So the reason why I say that is sometimes you just have to spell it out to yourself very concretely on paper. Like what 
exactly is necessary to get to your goal? First of all, what is your goal? What are the steps to get there? What do you need um, to get to those steps? What happens if you don't get those resources? And be painfully honest with yourself about it. And so then you can remove that gray mist where you can trick yourself into thinking that like, you might be able to bend over all the way backwards until you're flat on your back to do it. So once you remove that mirage, right, and you force yourself to face the truth squarely, we'll almost have no choice. (laughs) The only rational choice now is to move forward. That being said, you then have to cross this next bridge, which is around, all right, so I know what my objective is. I know what it's going to take to get there, but how do I access those resources? And that's like a massive challenge, especially for female POC founders. And to do that, I think one is do your best to lean into the network that you have. Go to places where people, find people who look like you, who have done similar things. And I say similar things because, for example, this accelerator program asked me like, what kind of mentorship would I be looking for? And I was trying to find well, it'd be really great to find another black female who started a fintech in Surtech. Um, <laughs> but if I'm waiting for that as a mentor, right, successfully, if I'm waiting for that as a mentor, I'm going to be waiting a good long time, right? So don't necessarily look for somebody who looks exactly like you, who's trying to do exactly the same thing, because you probably won't find it. But try and look for somebody who has done something similar enough and can bring um, perspective to your experience. That's one side of it. Then the other side of it, and this is one of the issues with like affinity programs that you often see in the corporate environment, is that you can't, don't make your only focus and strategy finding people who are like you, because then you can end up in a situation where it's like, I don't want to say like the blind leading the blind, but you want to crack into other networks. So go out of your way to try and make connections with people who don't look like you and try and leverage that as well. Fantastic. So this sounds like a pretty challenging, meaty journey. Have there been internal challenges where you've doubted yourself? What have been some of those? And oh, yeah, for sure. Like when I left Allstate, you know, I said to myself at the time that we're going to do this. We're going to do it for like a year and see where it goes. And if it doesn't work out, you know, you could always go back to like the corporate world. And so then like fast forward, like maybe six, seven months into it and I'm wow, okay, we're getting closer to that year mark and we still haven't gotten any funding to the level that we would need to get to an MVP. What are we going to do? And I was just just trying to run through like my options and then it hit me. I was like, Sita, if Sentinel doesn't work, the answer isn't that you go back to the corporate world. We can't do that. If Sentinel doesn't work, the answer is we find another way to deliver value as an entrepreneur, because the reasons why you left the corporate sphere have not changed. And your fundamental belief about entrepreneurship as a vehicle to deliver value also haven't changed. If Sentinel isn't working, it means that there's a misunderstanding on your part, either around the problem or the solution. So we pivot, right? So I I would say that. Excellent. So a few other questions in terms of just that some of the tactics One thing which I meant to bring up earlier was there's a lot of stuff here. We talked about valuation, about compensation, all of which have to do come back to this question of financial, understanding the financial chassis of the business, so to speak, and projections and the business unit economics. How comfortable did you feel tackling that and what worked for you to master those and enough to be able to run your business successfully? Yeah, I would say for that, between things that I would highlight would be my experience working as a management strategy consultant at Bain, as well as the MBA from Booth. So as a management strategy consultant, you have to learn how to be a jack of all trades really quickly, especially working at a firm like Bain, where they have a generalist model. So it's kind of like, you don't go in, this is my specialty. Um, it's kind of like, whatever the challenge is, <laughs> whatever the case demands, whatever the client's needs are, you're going to figure that out. So when I was at Bain in particular, and why I chose it was for that generalist experience. And so I got it. So I had the opportunity to do lots of financial model development and all of that. So I knew I knew enough to be dangerous and not just to be dangerous, but also enough to know when and where to bring in specialized counsel should I need it. So between those things, I think that's how I've been able to navigate those areas. And for those who may not have had that exposure or experience, what would you suggest as a good alternative? Yeah, so I think... 
The first answer, in my opinion, isn't to immediately spring to raising your hand for help. I think that it's important to be informed because otherwise like people could tell you anything, right? So I would say number one is whether it's like getting some books, going through your network to find people who work in those areas, like get informed. That being said, don't be doing something that you shouldn't be doing that you don't have the skill set to do. So once you're informed, once you tap your network, find counsel to actually help you build out those things that you need to build out. And to do that, once again, like that's leveraging your network, whether that's through where you've worked before or through school, friends, that sort of a thing, LinkedIn, just doing a shout out saying like, I need to understand how to do this. We've covered a lot of ground. I know we're also probably out of time. Kind of to conclude, maybe I'll ask you two questions. One is, what do you now know that you wish you knew at the start of this journey? And then secondly, kind of related to that, therefore, what advice would you give to others who may be earlier on the path than you are today? Yeah, I would say, so the first part is like, what's one thing that I wish I'd known? Yeah, which you now know. That I now know. I think one thing that I'd wished I'd known that I now know is that a lot of the struggles that I went through, it wasn't just me. And like one of the meaningful parts of the experience that I've had in this accelerator program is just being able to hear the stories from other founders. And it's kind of like, wait, I'm not the only one. So it's kind of like, don't despair. If you feel like you're trying to figure something out or something just isn't clicking, just isn't working, the problem is probably not really necessarily you. It just might be like a par for course aspect of the experience. And I think that's really why it's important for an entrepreneur to embed themselves in entrepreneurial community. People often say that entrepreneurship can be a very lonely road. Um, that's true, but it doesn't have to be. And so by like embedding yourself in community, you can definitely learn from the experiences of others and realize that oftentimes it's not just you. So would that be your advice too, or would you have something else uh, in terms I of think advice? Maybe a little bit more advice. Okay. So one piece of advice uh, would be know your passion. To me, entrepreneurship isn't so much about the business idea itself as it is about a way of working. If you know that you are passionate about working in the entrepreneurial way, you're going to face challenges no matter what your business idea is, but focus on not so much the type of value you want to deliver, though that's very important, but how you want to deliver the value too. And I think that in those moments that are dark, because there will be dark moments, it can be a shining guiding light to keep you going and moving you forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Sotra. This has been an amazing conversation. I really appreciate the time. I'm glad. Thank you so much for chatting with me. I've really enjoyed it as well. My conversation with Sota was easily one of the most instructive in terms of the nuts and bolts details of getting a complex startup off the ground. Three things stood out for me. First, Sota is a rare entrepreneur in how she took an extremely strategic and long-term view of her startup even before she took the first step. She realized that she'd never be able to bootstrap her business, and yet she took a very smart and intentional approach to using the money she had to land her where she needed to be. Second, I love the approach she took to selecting the exact right accelerator for her startup. Most first-time entrepreneurs aren't alert to the big and small differences between various accelerators, and often they don't have anybody they can learn this from. Because of her thoughtful selection process, she neatly sidestepped a lot of the problems that could have come back to bite her later or caused her to start up to do less than its full potential. Last but not least, no matter how rational and spreadsheet-driven she's been throughout, she's never lost sight of the mission behind all of this work her drive to create social impact in an economically meaningful way. She was very careful in how she defined value, not in terms of being a unicorn, but in terms of how much immediate and tangible impact she could deliver to society. This kind of upfront clarity is the only thing you can fall back on when the going gets tough and you have to make calls based on fuzzy data or no data at all. So what decision are you about to make with your startup that you can look at differently with the long view in mind? Thanks for listening to today's episode. We have show notes and more at achieve.co. That's A-C-H-I-I-V dot C-O forward slash podcast. Like what you heard? Hit subscribe and share with a friend. See you on the next episode. Now, go be an achiever.